Thank you very much, Chancellor. And while our first panel is making its way um, up here, you probably all know who our first panelists are, Amanda Mazzoni and Steve Powers, Rebecca Morgenstern Brenner, John Pomilio. So please come on up and take your spot. And while you make your way, I want to thank Chancellor Stanley for the um, very encouraging welcome. When I became um, a member of ESF's staff, one of the first places I went was up to SUNY Oswego, and uh, Deb and I sat in her office, and she gave me a quick lesson on all things SUNY, and I will be forever grateful for your um, help as I transitioned into this role. And I'll say in my previous life as a county executive, this kind of subject matter that is available to us today would have been huge and I'm, I'm happy that there's people now that are registered here in local government. I did see the list. There's Onondaga County folks here as well. Um, you know, the lessons that we can learn from this expertise, um, you know, it's gonna change the world. So without further ado, I will welcome all of you to panel one. It's the state, local climate and energy program panel. We're gonna hear from three sets of panelists that work to implement climate and energy programs at the local level using state programs and bringing together higher education institutions with community stakeholders. These presentations particularly reflect on how climate policies and programs are not just happening successfully in our larger urban cities, but in and across our rural communities uh, in New York State, as, as Chancellor Stanley just mentioned. Up first, uh, with a presentation on NYSERDA Clean Energy Communities Program and DEC Climate Smart Communities Program is Amanda Mazzoni. I will turn this over to you. She is the Principal Planner, Energy Management Program, Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board. Did I get that right? Welcome. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Amanda Mazzoni. I'm with the Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board. Um, this presentation is primarily geared towards municipal officials, but if you're not a municipal official, please contact your municipal officials about the programs that I'm going to describe. Um, you know, it's great to get communities involved, and, and these programs that I'm going to discuss are um, really at the municipal level, but with, with a community engagement component um, to try to encourage clean energy and sustainability at, at um, both the municipal operations and the community scale. Um, so just in case you're not familiar with the Regional Planning and Development Board, we are a public agency that was founded in 1966, uh, and we serve the five counties in central New York. That includes Cayuga, Cortland, Madison, Onondaga, and Oswego counties. We have um, staff that works uh, throughout the counties uh, in every municipality related to each of these program areas. Um, I work in the energy management program, and our team is made up of myself, uh, my colleague Chris Carrick, who's the program manager. And then my other colleague, Michael Bocuzzi, who's here today. You can raise your hand, Mike. Um, he is the Climate Smart Communities Coordinator for Central New York. And I am also the Clean Energy Communities Coordinator for Central New York. So um, we are really your go-to place for any questions you have related to clean energy, sustainability, um, how to fund projects, how to earn uh, grants or, or uh, financing programs. So. Um, please talk to us or tell your municipal officials to talk to us um, to, to help implement um, the projects that, that you have in mind for your community. Um, just quickly, I wanted to set the stage for the presentation, but also for really the day. Um, of course, New York State has the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act goals um, related to uh, renewable energy and reducing emissions. And the key here is that the state on its own is not going to be able to achieve these goals. They, they need local governments and they need communities uh, to implement projects in order to reach these goals. So that is you know, kind of the reason why these two state programs that I'm going to explain exist and have recently been really bolstered by the state and relaunched and reinvigorated. So the first program I'll explain is NYSERDA's Clean Energy Communities Program. 
Uh, this program was originally launched in 2016. Um, and the idea is that there is a statewide network of clean energy community coordinators like myself that can provide free assistance to municipalities throughout the state um, in implementing clean energy projects. The other component of this program is that as communities work through the program and implement the clean energy actions, you can earn grants for additional clean energy projects to be implemented. Um, the program, uh, like I said, has regional coordinators throughout the state. So if you are not from central New York, um, there's definitely somebody to contact. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, I can make sure you get into contact with the correct person if you're not from this region. Um, but the coordinators, again, provide free assistance to communities to really implement any types of clean energy or sustainability projects that you have in mind. Um, the program was so successful that it was relaunched in 2021 with additional grant funding and adding some new actions. Um, so there's now three ways that communities can earn grants through the program by completing uh, actions, uh, by, by um, completing actions, you earn points that can earn you different levels of grants as shown on the slide here. If you complete four actions, your community is considered a designated clean energy community, which will earn you a, a $5,000 uh, grant. And then there's action grants for completing community education and outreach campaigns related to specific clean energy technologies. Um, so there's a lot of ways that communities and municipalities can participate in, in this program. Um, both on the municipal operations side, community outreach side, and, and earning grants along the way. Um, I have the, the actions listed here at, for time's sake. I'm not going to go through them, but the, the one point I wanted to make is that uh, the Climate Smart Communities program, which I'm going to be describing briefly next, is also integrated into this Clean Energy Communities program. Um, so if your community becomes a certified bronze or silver climate smart community, you can earn points in the clean energy communities program towards those grants I was mentioning. Um, so the two state programs are separate, but again, really integrated and, and overlap. Um, these are just the rest of the actions in this program. So um, there's obviously a lot of participation in this program. Um, all of those blue dots are, are communities participating throughout the state. Um, the dark blue dots are communities that have completed at least four actions in the program. Um, many of them have completed many more than four actions. Um, and then the, the light blue are communities that have completed at least one action. So if your community is not yet participating, you have a lot of uh, neighboring communities that are that you could reach out to to um, get more information um, and see what their experiences have been. The other program I mentioned is the Climate Smart Communities program. It's primarily run through DEC's Office of Climate Change. Um, it is a more all-encompassing uh, sustainability program as opposed to the Clean Energy Communities program, which is really focused on energy. This program looks at um, both mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Uh, it incorporates um, climate action planning, resiliency planning, um, looking at waste management. Um, it's, it's, again, all, more all-encompassing when it comes to sustainability. Uh, the, the first step to participating in the Climate Smart Communities program is adopting the 10 element pledge um, to reduce emissions and prepare for climate change, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, once your community adopts the pledge, you can become a registered Climate Smart Community. And then if you would like, you can pursue the program further and become a certified bronze or silver Climate Smart Community, um, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, a lot of this program is kind of built around um, planning, like, like putting together greenhouse gas inventories for your community and climate action plans and, and some of the other resiliency plans, adaptation plans, and things like that. So um, there is a, a fairly strong planning component to the program, but also that implementation component as well. Um, as of a couple of months ago, there are now Climate Smart Community Coordinators, just like with the Clean Energy Community Program, that are available to assist your community at no, no cost to participate in this program. So as I mentioned before, Mike is the uh, Central New York Climate Smart Community Coordinator. 
Um, there are coordinators throughout the entire state. We work really close together, the clean energy communities and climate smart communities coordinators, um, because as I mentioned before, there's a lot of overlap and integration between the two programs. So the Climate Smart Communities Pledge is, is listed on here. It's, it's really say, stating that your community wants to work towards um, you know, planning for climate uh, action and setting goals and, and then implementing those, um, those uh, actions that, that you've been planning for, um, as well as adapting to climate smart and or to climate change. Um, and so the Climate Smart Certification Program is built around these 10 pledge elements. So there's each of the 10 pledge elements has a couple of actions, um, you know, as part of that pledge element that you can implement to earn points towards certification in this program. So the steps to participate in the, the Climate Smart Communities Program is, as I mentioned, pass the resolution adopting the pledge. Uh, register your community by uploading your adopted pledge online, uh, and then reviewing the actions and, um, and, and uploading and submitting documentation to DEC to get credit for the actions that your, your community has completed. Um, the, pri the, the really key step in this process is creating a Climate Smart Communities Task Force um, so that your community is not just relying on one or two people to, um, to implement these Climate Smart um, practices and, and really can provide support um, for your community working through um, your sustainability goals. Um, there's uh, some benefits to Climate Smart certification. There are um, additional bonus points that you can uh, be awarded through certain state funding applications, um, statewide uh, recognition, um, the points in the Clean Energy Communities program towards those grants, as I mentioned. And for the sake of time, I just want to go through this last slide really quickly. Um, the two programs are obviously very similar. Um, the main point I want to make is that as you complete the Clean Energy Communities program actions, you can earn points towards the Climate Smart Communities certification and vice versa. As you become certified in the Climate Smart Communities program, you can earn points towards grants in the Clean Energy Communities program. So they really work well together. It's really important to talk to your Climate Smart um, coordinator and your Clean Energy Communities coordinator um, and make sure that your community is getting credit uh, through the state and, and these grant opportunities um, for doing uh, actions that, that qualify in both programs. Um, a lot of communities are just really kind of familiar with one or the other, but really the two work together and, and can benefit your community um, in combination. Um, and this is just a quick uh, illustration of the fact that all of the clean energy communities actions are also climate smart communities actions, just that overlap. Um, so that will uh, conclude my 10 minutes. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I've been able to go to the Rockefeller Institute on a number of occasions for um, conferences and presentations. And the fact, Bob, that you and your team have brought this here to us. Thank you very much. Up next for presentation number two are Steve Powers and Rebecca Morgenstern Brenner, and they will present, come on up, on bridging the policy gap to climate change adaptation in rural areas. Welcome. Nice shot. I had baseball players for kids. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, we don't have our slide up. Do we have to? Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. Um, great to be here with you today. We're going to just really briefly talk about um, a method for bridging the policy gap of climate change and adaptation in rural areas. Um, I'm Rebecca Morgan Sternbrenner. I'm faculty in the Brooks School of Public Policy at Cornell. I'm here with my colleagues, Steve Powers, who's the chair of the New Lebanon Climate Smart uh, Task Force Committee. He's going to talk in just a moment. And uh, Mark Anthonyanson, who's an advisor on the New Lebanon um, Climate Smart Task Force. And so what the challenge here is, you just heard about Climate Smart Communities, super fan, and thank you so much for the programs. They're really important to uh, all of us to, to approach and attack climate change. Um, is I, I'm really interested in how we can work with communities 
uh, to reduce vulnerability to uh, climate change and what's coming at us and build resilience with different communities. Uh, with Climate Summer Communities, again, great program, but there's a challenge in that they ten we see a tendency for left-leaning or more affluent communities to have either the capacity or the will to move forward with investing in these options. But there's a lot of communities out there, and we wanted to take um, take a, a, a little moment to try to overcome this barrier and work with the town in New Lebanon, which is a rural, politically divided community, and see if we can support them in getting um, into climate smart communities. And so we did this in two ways. Um, I, I teach a course with graduate students at Cornell, and it's a service learning based course where we work with, uh, with different community partners to build their capacity and give them capacity through the students. And so instead of them doing theoretical projects, they're doing real work for different communities. Uh, and so we, we, starting in 2020, between uh, courses and internships, we've given this additional capacity to New Lebanon. And also we work with New Lebanon and they have, and we have deliberately looked for projects that are, um, that really include a wide range of perspectives that are not controversial, that people on, all, on any political spectrum feel like they can get behind and see the value in. And so what this looks like is that students have invested in these projects. They do background research, methodology, they do uh, focus groups, we've done surveys and vulnerability assessments. Um, to support all the different levels and uh, have I, this past spring looked to identify green jobs uh, and expanding their, uh, their economy and uh, really what their needs are and work with the students to build that capacity. And so this is translated into action that in just a minute, uh, my colleague Steve Powers is going to show you what it looks like. But what's been really cool is to look at universities and other anchor institutions as instead of doing theoretical projects, doing real work and, build, and giving back and in an organized way, I'll say that as a faculty member, this takes a lot of work in organizing and making sure you're not wasting the time of your community partner because they may have limited capacity as well. Um, and the next slide is that I'm, I'm super excited to share that um, New Lebanon is, uh, has gotten the bronze certification for um, Climate Smart Communities, the first one in Columbia County to do so, and Columbia County itself is now engaging in the process. And so I'm going to introduce Steve Powers, who can show what that looks like in New Lebanon. We're really excited to share. Thank you, Rebecca. And thanks to the Rockefeller Institute, Institute and, uh, for inviting us to present the New Lebanon story. Um, my name is Steve Powers, and I'm the chair of the Climate Smart Communities Task Force for New Lebanon, or the CSC as we call it. Um, and in addition to Rebecca, as she mentioned, we have Mark Anthonison, who is here um, in that photo and in the front row here. Um, so thanks to Amanda, you're now all experts in the CSC program, and there will be a test at the end of this uh, session. No, just kidding. I know some people in the back, they're panicked when they heard that. Um, New, New Lebanon, which is a town of only 2,300 people, was able to submit 25 action items to the DEC on January 8th, 2021, uh, just 10 months after setting up our task force. Um, on February 26, we were informed that we had received the um, bronze level. We're the first town in Columbia County, as she mentioned, and, and quite possibly the fastest in the uh, history of the program to achieve it. So how do we do it? Well, that's top secret, and we've redacted those informa that information from the presentation. We'll need a court order. No. Seriously, uh, I refer to it as a um, result of a perfect storm of events. Um, it started with a new town board being elected. Uh, previous attempts to get uh, New Lebanon's boards to pass a resolution to become a climate smart community were shot down. The new board took up the proposal without hesitation. Uh, along with the new town board came a new town supervisor, Tistria Hotling, who in her previous position as town clerk had convinced the previous board to approve a few actions on the Clean Energy Communities Program. Those actions and a motivated uh, team of CSC volunteers allowed us to get the points in the program. And of course, our partnership with Mark, Rebecca, and Cornell was crucial. 
you know, they, they say that it's not the intent or the cause, it's the impact that matters. And I don't think it was climate change that influenced that saying, but when dealing with community neighbors in uh, rural communities, it's a perfect way to proceed, I think. We try to emphasize the local, local impacts of climate change like flooding, heat waves, and drought, and what we can do to mitigate them rather than dwelling on what caused them or who's to blame. We have to show them how they've been directly affected by what's going on now and not hundreds of years from now. So one of the first programs we pursued was composting because uh, task force mem members were interested and it seemed uh, pretty innocuous. Uh, we produced a video and flyers that were put up on the town website and distributed at the farmer's market. To entice relatable interest, we offered free refurbished bikes in a program that actually Mark created and we still operate with the help of a retired bike mechanic and others. They've overhauled more than 200 donated bikes and distributed them to uh, neighbors in need. We had an existing free store uh, that our supervisors started a few years ago out of the town hall. And uh, in July, we participated in the first climate carnival on the uh, uh, county fairgrounds and had a giant free store uh, composed of ours and neighboring town items which were attended and attracted people who might not otherwise have attended a festival uh, if it was only focused on climate change. We set up and continue to operate repair cafes which where members of the community can bring items to be repaired instead of throwing them into landfills. Uh, this brings together many fixers from the communities who might not otherwise participate in CSA programs. These are all ways to create bonds and goodwill with our neighbors, linking us directly at the grassroots level. Aside from community building, um, we've um, taken advantage of programs that are structured to assist communities like ours. As Amanda mentioned, NYSERDA offers grants in towns for actions in the CEC or Clean Energy Communities Program. We've com uh, completed programs to upgrade LED streetlights as well as town hall lights, installed an EV charger, passed the New York stretch code, did campaigns for community solar and heat pumps, and are currently doing one promoting electric vehicles. This year, as a result of these actions, we expect to get $50,000 in grant for, um, from NYSERDA for uh, clean energy upgrades at town hall that are estimated to save the town residents about $9,000 a year in bills, uh, oil bills, uh, through efficient heat pumps. It's a way that we can show that fighting climate change can bring financial uh, rewards to the town while we reduce our carbon uh, footprint. Working to make our community climate smart has caught on. Our neighboring towns have reached out to us to help guide them towards achieving the same thing for their communities, and we've eagerly taken on the advisory role in doing so while continuing to take on uh, projects in New Lebanon. The CSC and the CEC programs are excellent ways for towns to mitigate climate change while bringing rural community members together. Uh, for me at least, the key to maintaining that success is to have fun and make sure the others, uh, other volunteers are having fun as well. So thank you for listening and let me know if you have any questions later. Look forward to talking to you. Thanks. Wow, that was weirdly perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there's such good information, we don't want to cut anyone short. Uh, presentation number three from this first panel uh, on campus community partnerships in climate action planning, lessons from the field, welcome. John Pomilio, the Director of Sustainability at Colgate University. Thank you, President Mahoney. So nice to be here. I'm an ESF graduate. It, <laughs> I've always been super proud of that. No matter where my travels have taken me, I'm always attribute it back to my education here at SUNY ESF. So um, I am John Pamilio at the bottom, but I work really closely with a couple of my colleagues who couldn't be here today. Um, they're both really energetic, dynamic, intelligent 
uh, people, great presenters, so I apologize that you are stuck with me. <laughs> um, but Andy Pattison, one of my faculty colleagues over at Colgate is an environmental policy expert, and Professor Christopher Henke is a social scientist. So I'm a practitioner as the director of sustainability at, at, at a university. So as we do this work at the local community level, we like to step back and analyze what's happening around us and sort of evaluate um, what's working and what isn't, and then hopefully share that with other communities and people. So that's hopefully what I'll be able to do here in the next few minutes. Uh, most people are probably familiar with Colgate. It's not far from here, <laughs> but um, it's a small liberal arts college in a small rural community. So some of the things that Rebecca and Steve were talking about, we, I, we can relate to in our little community over in Hamilton, New York. Um, if there's anything that makes Colgate distinguished, maybe from other small liberal arts colleges, we have Division I athletics, and we have a fairly large uh, campus footprint for a small community, uh, 2.3 million square feet, 160 buildings for under 3,000 students. So it makes the challenge of sustainability maybe a little more um, challenging. We're smack dab in the geographic center of the state. The one thing I wanted to point out here is, you know, the institution is by most standards considered a wealthy institution, but our surrounding community, not so much. So um, there's an added dynamic there as well as being very politically diverse. Um, and then the bottom point, when we were looking at this data, um, since 2000, we've had 19 declared FEMA events in our county, in Madison County. And I'm guessing it's probably not that dissimilar from the county where you're at. So once we looked at that data, these events happen, sometimes they're small scale, they're disruptive, and then we get on with life and we move forward without realizing that climate change impacts are not just coastal or they're not just fires, but they're actually happening in, happening in small rural communities like ours and in other places. The university, I'm gonna go through some of this really quickly because, um, because I have to, <laughs> um, but the university has been at this for a little while, less than 20 years now, where we've decided to focus on our operations um, in addition to the way that we teach and learn to reduce our ecological and carbon footprints. So I came on board at Colgate shortly, well, in 2009 as the first director of sustainability at the university. We made a commitment to carbon neutrality. We achieved that in 2019. We became, it was the first college or university in New York State to be carbon neutral, and it's still that way today. There's only a handful of colleges or universities actually in the country that are carbon neutral, but we are the only one in New York State at this particular point in time. Um, we did climate action plans, and we've reduced our emissions. You know, this number fluctuates based on a number of factors, but roughly 50%. Uh, over the past 10 plus years. And then we use offsets to balance the remainder of our footprint. So while carbon mitigation remains important, the other thing that's really important here uh, dovetails to what I was just talking about, and that's that we're being impacted by climate change. So over the past few years, we've really made more formal commitments to climate adaptation and resilience. Um, this is our community garden, and this is actually in a student parking lot. Um, this is in a 100-year floodplain, and that's one of my students canoeing uh, in the parking lot through the garden gate. Um, and this was the third flood in three years in a 100-year floodplain. So 100-year floodplain just simply means 1% chance of flooding in any given year. It was clearly climate was changing right in, in front of us. So we had to move the garden um, after that. Um, this is not the Midwest. This is Madison County in the city of Oneida. Some probably remember this. FEMA um, actually relocated some of the residential area. 
Um, lots of damage throughout these rural communities, not a lot of financial support or resources to overcome them. We can still see the damage from storms and events that happened years ago. Um, we moved our little garden project to a new location, beautiful greenhouse, and then snowstorm Stella hit. This is also predicted by climate change, just more moisture in the air, more snowfall. Um, when things happen on campus, they're a really nice reminder that while we can overcome these things relatively easily, a, several greenhouses in our little county collapsed. Farmers were flooded out the same way our little garden was flooded out. And we like to remind our students and our community members of that fact that our community members are being really impacted by this. Amanda covered the Climate Smart Communities Program. Amanda is amazing. I don't really know where we would be without the Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board, without Chris Carrick, without Amanda, and Michael, I already took your name and number down and I'll be calling you as soon as I get back to my uh, table over there. <laughs> so we're really glad to have uh, the support of our community, of our um, coordinators at the local level. So Climate Smart Communities Program offers a beautiful framework to engage municipal officials on this work. Because when we're talking, why did I go through what we're doing at the university? It's simply because universities, um, while we like to pretend that there's boundaries there, when you're talking about environmental or climate issues, there really are no boundaries. The things that affect our local community also affect our campus. We can only move so far thinking about university boundaries before we have to work with our town and local officials. And actually, it's a lot of fun to do that, and it's more meaningful. Um, so it's been more meaningful for everybody, for our local leaders, for our students, for our faculty members, and for myself as a practitioner. So the Climate Smart Communities is really a good framework to, um, to provide um, some guardrails around this work so you can approach it in a very strategic way that's not so overwhelming, perhaps. We have been working at this for a little while. We had our kickoff meeting called the Hamilton Climate Preparedness Working Group um, back in 2016. We were very, um, we weren't trying to do things fast. We were trying to do them slow and bringing people along the way because if there's one thing that's crystal clear at the municipal level is most municipal leaders, despite good intentions, do not have the technical capacity to actually do this work. So they need support from university leaders, from Central New York Regional Planning and Development Board, from county planning boards, um, from the people around us to actually come together and work on these issues so that over stressed, overworked municipal leaders can get this work done without being overburdened in some ways. And um, it's a pretty diverse group. Um, that's just a quick um, list of some of the people who are part of the Hamilton Climate Preparedness Working Group. We've engaged students and faculty members along the way and these are students who helped us facilitate community-oriented workshops. Um, the town and the village both received bronze certification back in 2020, so we're working on next steps right now. This is a v terrible PowerPoint slide. Uh, uh, so everybody just come forward. <laughs> um, but I, really what I'm trying to show here is each one of these bullet points is a course. And in that course, students did a fraction of the work that helped our town and our village achieve Climate Smart Community Certification. And speaking with the students after the class and even after graduation, they say this work is one of the true highlights of their Colgate experience. Um, this is one of my former interns who helped me uh, do the first greenhouse gas inventory at Colgate University. He then went on to do the greenhouse gas inventory of the United States of America, <laughs> um, working for the EPA. And he loves Colgate and he loves Hamilton, so he came back and helped us put a climate action plan together for the town and the village a couple years back. Um, and then we achieved the climate action plan. This is my last uh, slide. 
And really what it's showing is a little bit of the progress that we've made over the past few years. Um, there's some really key take home points out of this work. Um, I'd be happy to share those with you, uh, maybe in the Q&A, or if anybody wants to contact me offline. Um, we also published um, a paper out of this work and plan on doing much more in the future on this. So thank you all for being here and for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions. Uh, thank you very much, John. We are also proud that you're an ESF grad, and that is a theme. We have climate warriors all over the state doing this really good work. And we'll move into Q&A if there's any questions from the audience. And um, I will say that John's right that municipal leaders, and I was able to count myself among them as county executive, could not do it without their college partners. We could not have done the work we did without the work um, the ESF faculty and students did to support us along the way, so spot on. Uh, are there any questions? I have a, a couple, but I thought, oh, yes. Um, I don't know if there's a microphone or if you just want to, oh, you have a mic, way, way over here. <laughs> I didn't realize that that was going to mean that I was going right now. I was going to prepare myself a little bit more. <laughs> but you're just asking if we had questions. Um, I was wondering, like the higher education institutions that are partnering with municipalities, um, I'm from the town of Manlius. I'm a town counselor there. We've become a clean energy community. We're our cli first climate smart community in Onondaga County um, as of January of this year. Where are higher education institutions and the planning board taking communities after they achieve these municipal programs, after they achieve these goals, like we're getting charging stations, we're getting EVs, um, we're working on a cl climate action plan with Amanda right now, who is fantastic, as everyone's already said. Um, where do we go next? Where are our higher, edu uh, higher education institutions taking municipalities next? Thank you. Jump in, we have higher ed on the panel. I'll, I'll share that I think there's an unlimited amount of work to be done with what's facing us as far as the challenge climate change is presenting to us. And one thing that we know is that, especially in, up, in everywhere, but in upstate New York, we're going to face more intense climate uh, disasters. And we know we need to invest more in building, uh, reducing vulnerability in the most vulnerable residents in those communities. And I think there's just an unlimited amount of work. I think that the Climate Smart Community is, is a great guide to take steps forward, but the universities have unlimited amount of, of classes and capacity of students who are gonna learn how to work with the municipalities, and so what you get a double benefit if you continue to invest in working with, you know, if you get gold, just keep going and, and don't stop working to reduce what the challenges that are facing the communities, because the students then come out with this added experience of being able to engage with people, and then they are our future, and hopefully will will help us deal with the world that is coming at us. You know, and, and I would add too that if you you said you hadn't reached the bronze level, yes. there's a silver level too. So, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you, you know, there's so much to do, and and certainly if you have a motivated team there to work with you, I think that uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, I don't know what programs or what actions have you completed with the uh, to get to the bronze level, but uh, you know we're probably 40 points from getting silver or so, and um, there's there's a lot of other actions that you can certainly work on. And I think you'll hear about some of them in future panels as well. Any other? Yes, sir. There's another question. Oh, there's two. Sorry about that. Thanks. Um, it, it's a specific point just within one of the presentations about Colgate, and, but it's a more general question that I think maybe we could all try to answer during the day, but on the, you said you're using call, carbon offsets as a, so I was just curious about your approach to carbon offsets and maybe evolving thought on that. Yeah, sure. When, when we committed to carbon neutrality, it was, you know, over 10 years ago. So we looked at our emissions profile and we realized you know, because when we're an institution included in our carbon footprint 
is air travel and commuter emissions. So we immediately realized we can't eliminate that in the near term. So let's give ourselves a 10-year grace period to reduce our carbon footprint as much as possible. And then at that 10-year mark, we're going to take accountability for what's, whatever's left. So when, and that's where carbon offsets come in. So what we do as a campus community is we, we, um, we have a, a committee. <laughs> because you always have to have a committee. Shocking. Yeah, <laughs> and um, we put out an RFP, um, a request for a proposal. Um, we usually get responses from 40 or 50 different offset providers, and usually over 100 different projects represented from all over the world and local, and as well as New York State-based. And then what we do is we solicit the rest of the campus community on what they value in a carbon offset project. This also gives us the opportunity to really engage community members on our work that sometimes goes under the hood because on a campus community, people are sometimes less excited about talking you know, about HVAC systems and building envelopes and stuff like that. But if they know it's part of our carbon footprint, then they will do that. So. We often end up with a suite of offset projects, some international, some local, some renewable energy, some forestry based, and um, all of them are third party certified high quality, except for we've partnered with the Finger Lakes Climate Fund uh, last year. That means that some of Colgate's offset dollars go to support low to moderate income families in our county. Um, and uh, helps them to do renewable energy projects or emission reduction projects. So the family benefits by getting an energy project done, um, and then the university benefits by taking the carbon credit for that. So we, we piloted that last year. We plan on expanding it in the years ahead. And that is an ongoing discussion here at ESF as well, because we have 25,000 acres of forest, and there is a debate about whether to count that or to continue to um, work on our operation side. So I saw a couple more questions, If wherever the mic is. There you go. Oh, hi, um, my name's Steve. I'm with the SUNY Geneseo Energy Manager. Um, I believe my community, where I'm at Geneseo, it's a small population, maybe 8,000. Um, I don't think we're a climate smart community. Um, so if I were to solicit or find someone to kind of get that ball moving, on the municipality level, where would I start? Would I start at the county level, town, village? Right there with Amanda. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. is my wife working? Yeah, okay, <laughs> I couldn't tell. Yeah, so you, you, would, you, would, you could really start anywhere, um, but I would suggest starting at the municipality um, that the, um, uh, that the college is located within. So is Geneseo in the village of Geneseo or the town? And, and start start in the village. Um, you could then move to the town. Um, and, and actually, it's it works really well if towns and villages work together um, because there's always a lot of shared services and sometimes shared buildings. Um, so, so definitely, I would say start where your where your college is located, um, but and then move out from there. Um, count, the, approaching the county is also helpful because sometimes if they have buy-in, um, they can help kind of have the trickle-down effect to the municipalities within that want to you know emulate what the county's doing. Um, I'll also just quickly note. I got my undergrad from Geneseo and grad degree at ESF, so <laughs> I'm <laughs> well represented here. <laughs> Perfect, and I think we have uh, time for one more question for this panel. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah Nahar, third year PhD student in religion and environmental studies. And something even more boring than HVAC systems are sewer systems. And my question is whether or not uh, any of your communities have been working on this aspect. I studied the toilet, both the ritual and the receptacle, and this question of it. So if you could just speak to any of that, because it's literally out of sight, out of mind for many. Until it backs up, then we got a conversation. Yeah, so um, they're within the Climate Smart Communities Program and clean, well, and clean Energy Communities Program, wastewater treatment facilities are definitely 
uh, in included septic uh, emissions. So when you're doing a greenhouse gas inventory for your community, that is those those are emissions that are that are included and counted. Um, and then as you're doing your climate action plan, there's those are things that are taken into consideration. Um, clean energy upgrades at your facilities definitely are a part of the clean energy communities and climate smart program. So definitely wastewater um, sewage treatment is is a part of each of the programs. Um, but as far as specifics to what communities are doing, I'll let the other folks chime in. So we're uh, the town of New Lebanon does not have a wastewater treatment plant. We are actually uh, in the process of uh, developing a feasibility study for one right now. So perfect timing for that question. And I recommend that you check out the savetherain.us um, website to see what the county's done to keep the stormwater out of the sewer systems. The Office of the Environment Director, Travis, is here nodding, so you can ask him. That is all the time that we have for this panel. Thank you all very much for sharing your expertise. And I'm going to turn it over to not Laura Rainbow, Laura Rabineau, and um, this is my last time at the mic, so I just want to take an opportunity to thank the team here at ESF. They've done tremendous work partnering with the Rockefeller Institute to put this event on. We are really grateful that you're here, Bob. Come again.